In this lecture, we're going to look at the following basic things. Verbs and prepositions do the following things in every single sentence that they're in. They select arguments, they assign theta roles to the arguments, and they assign case to the arguments. And this is in contrast to auxiliary modal verbs, which you do not do any of these things at all. Please note, we're not going to be talking much about case in this lecture. So let's start off by making a distinction between arguments and adjuncts. So arguments are obligatory. That is to say, the sentence is quite ungrammatical without them, and adjuncts are optional. So even if you take them out, the sentence is still uh, grammatical. Here's some examples. You can say, I saw the cat on the roof. Uh, on the roof, there's an adjunct, because you can say something like, I saw the cat. Katy Perry probably kissed a girl on Tuesday, and she liked it quite a lot. All well, the green text is an adjunct, so you could, you could remove it. Katy Perry kissed a girl, and she liked it. Or you can say, Katy Perry probably kissed a girl. And she liked it. Hopefully the robbers only took all the diamonds in the safe. You can remove the green parts. The robbers took all the diamonds in the safe. Uh, the same cannot be said if you take the underlined noun phrases, which are all arguments. You'll see that become, the sentences become quite ungrammatical. Hopefully only took in the safe. You can try that for yourself with the other sentences. Now, verbs can be classified according to the grammatical categories that they select. Now, most often we think of these as nouns. But in fact, verbs can select a number of other grammatical categories, including prepositions, sentences, uh, etc. So intransitive verbs, which you might have heard of before, they typically select one noun phrase as its subject. Transitive verbs select one noun phrase subject and also one noun phrase object. Ditransitive verbs select one noun phrase subject and two noun phrase objects. Some, of course, might select one noun phrase object and a prepositional phrase, for example, something like put. And then there are many other kinds of verbs. For example, bridge verbs select uh, a sentence from which you can extract a question. So let's have a look at uh, transitive verbs and selection. Transitive verbs, you'll remember, select one noun phrase subject and an object. And many of them are quite optionally transitive. For instance, you can say, I saw the cat, the predicate or the verb. Saw selects a subject I and it selects the cat as an object. And you can also delete the object and you can have something like, I saw, and that is quite grammatical. Other verbs are not as forgiving if you remove the objects. For instance, in the sentence, Katy Perry kissed a girl and she liked it, if you remove the noun phrase a girl and or the noun phrase it, you get a strange kind of combination. You say, Casey, Katy kissed, kind of leaves something missing, doesn't it? It feels like we need something extra in the sentence. Similarly, if, if, similarly, if you say, she liked, it seems as if there's something missing. Uh, that sense of missingness or that sense of uh, feeling that the sentence doesn't fit well is called ungrammaticality. And as linguists, we have to cultivate that, that intuition about which sen uh, sentences or utterances and which are grammatical and which are ungrammatical. The robbers took all the diamonds. If you delete that object and it becomes the robbers took, then it is ungrammatical too. My grandmother read lots of romance novels. It is still possible to say something like, my grandmother read. Diatransitives. This verb type select one noun phrase subject and two usually noun phrase object. The class wrote the SRC an open letter. For instance, the wrote selects the class as its subject and it's uh, the SRC as an indirect object and an open letter as the direct object. Every mother gave her granddaughter a pack of biscuits. The verb gave selects every grandmother's subject and then as the indirect object, her granddaughter as direct object, a packet of biscuits. But please note, not every ditransitive takes a noun phrase. For instance, coming back to that verb put, which we mentioned earlier, the janitor put the dustbin beside the door is a perfectly good sentence. However, if you remove beside the door, you end up with the following, the janitor put the dustbin, and that is not grammatical in English. Now you notice in the slides that we have a star and a couple of brackets. You'll notice that the star is outside the brackets. That means if you remove what's inside the brackets, beside the door, then the result is an ungrammatical sentence. Let's have a look at another one. The president ordered the ministers to implement service delivery. That is a perfectly good sentence, but if you omit the prepositional phrase, you get the following. The president ordered the ministers, and that seems ungrammatical, and we indicate that with a star. And you can see once again that the star is placed outside the brackets, just to show that if you were to remove the uh, thing in the brackets, it would be uh, an ungrammatical sentence. Let's look at some intransitives. Intransitive verbs select one noun phrase. 
For instance, each student laughed, my brother sneezed. Uh, the book arrived and the post, the cat ran. Intransitive verbs. Intransitive verbs select one noun phrase. For instance, the verb laugh selects a subject. Each student laughed or my brother sneezed or the book arrived, the post or the cat ran. We will be coming back to the con contrast between ran and dashed uh, a little bit later. So I'm going to skip over that point for now. So what have we learned so far? Well, we've learned that verbs uh, or predicates more generally select various categories that they can go with. Then these categories are noun phrases, prepositional phrases, etc. We call this process selection. And this is a purely grammatical effect. However, there's also something else going on in these kinds of sentences. And that involves meaning. So verbs seem to assign meaningful semantic roles to noun phrase. These are going to be called thematic roles, also called theta roles. And sometimes they are denoted by a little Greek letter theta. But we won't worry too much about that in this course. And after a lot of research and a lot of time spent, linguists have worked out that there is something called the theta criterion, which determines what's actually going on. Uh, the theta criterion says every noun phrase in a sentence must have one theta role, and every theta role in the sentence must be assigned by one verb or preposition as the case may be. I want you to try and remember that because it becomes important later on. So what do we mean by theta roles? You might have covered some of these things at school, or maybe not. Examples of theta roles are the following. The agent is typically the doer of the sentence. The experiencer is the entity which is directly affected by the event being carried out. The theme and, or the patient is the entity which is directly receiving the event being carried out. Now, it should be noted that theme and Patient can be quite confusing to distinguish, so generally I don't worry too much about trying to distinguish them. If you are confused about what theta role is being uh, applied, then chances are it is a theme or a patient. So that's a rule of thumb that you can use. The instrument is the thing which is used to carry out the event, the goal, the direction to which an event moves, the source, the direction from which the event comes, the location is the location at where the event is carried out. A benefactor is someone or something that benefits from the event. Theta roles in action. Here we have a sentence, I saw the cat. The verb saw selects a noun phrase subject and a noun phrase object. We talked about that in the previous section of the lecture. But we can also see that the doer of the sentence, I, is the A. We would call that the agent. And the object, the cat, is the patient. Let's look at another sentence. Katy Perry kissed a girl and she liked it. Kissed has an agent. The do of the kissing is Katy Perry. The patient, uh, or the experiencer, if you like, is a girl. Um, if, if you look, then look at the second sentence, she liked it. Like signs a uh, experiencer theta role to the uh, pronoun she. And the theme is going to be that. The next sentence, the robbers took all the diamonds. Who took all the diamonds? Well, the robbers did. The robbers are the doers, so they are the agent. What did they take? They took all the diamonds. So that is the patient, or, in, or maybe more technically the theme, because it's not a hand. My grandmother read lots of romance novels. Who is the doer of the reading? My grandmother. She is the agent. What did she read? Well, lots of romance novels. Up till now, we've introduced selection, the idea that verbs select grammatical categories, such as prepositional phrases, noun phrases, etc., and that they also assign thematic roles to the noun phrase. Now, at first glance, that seems a little odd. How would a verb do two separate things? Are they perhaps not the same thing? Isn't it just the case that verbs select something and that theta roles are just part of that, that they are the same thing? Why do we need two separate rules instead of one? So this is actually a really interesting question. I think it's a really important question that one wants to ask because if we're trying to develop a scientific theory of language, then it's important that it's the simplest possible theory. And these are exactly the kinds of questions that scientists would ask. So let us try and see if we can't uh, uh, explore this, this a little bit more. Now, in this case, you can see that Jack and Slept the Cat is clearly ungrammatical. However, we do understand what that could mean. So it, it's not that this doesn't have any semantics. It's just that it is not a good English sentence. Uh, what would Jackson slept the cat mean? Well, it means something like uh, Jackson made the cat sleep. Perhaps Jackson was petting the cat and the cat slowly closed its eyes and drifted off to sleep. However, even though the sentence has a possible meaning, it's not grammatical. What does that tell us? It tells us that the meaning is not enough to make a sentence grammatical. 
tells us that meaning and the selection restriction are not the same thing. Let's have a look at another uh, pair. Jackson donated the money and Jackson gave the money. Jackson donated the money is a grammatical sentence. However, Jackson gave the money seems a little odd. Uh, I've put a question mark in front of that to show that it doesn't seem right. Now, both sentences have more or less the same meaning. They have the same semantics. Both involve Jackson as the agent uh, providing the money uh, to some other um, uh, entity. Um, but what we can see here is that the one is, is, is more odd. Why would that be? Well, donated selects two noun phrases, uh, and it's quite happy with that, whereas give selects uh, three. Jackson gave the money to the charity. Now, you want to compare that with the following. Jackson donated the charity the money. Sounds a little odd. That's why we have a question mark in front of it. Whereas Jackson gave the charity the money is perfectly fine. Again, these two sentences have exactly the same semantics. They've got the same kind of meaning. But the one is odd and the one is not. What does that suggest to us? Well, it suggests that these verbs are kind of unique in their selection or restriction. Namely, that donated is not a ditransitive in the same way that give clearly is. So even though both verbs would have the same uh, uh, theta roles potentially to assign, uh, in, in each case it is the selection restrictions that cause this to be ungrammatic. Finally, let's have a look at the cat ran versus the cat dashed under the bed. The cat ran is perfectly good grammatical sentence and the cat dashed seems not to be. It seems that there's something missing. Um, run is an intransitive, it selects uh, just uh, an agent, the cat ran. Uh, whereas Dash also selects a, a subject that is an agent, but it also selects a prepositional phrase or some kind of a, um, a, a location or goal uh, that's really important for these sentences to be grammatical. Now, interestingly, run and dash mean more or less the same thing. Um, if, if you say the cat dashed under the bed or the cat ran under the bed, they can mean pretty much the same thing. Uh, both involve the cat scooting from one end to the other, but the one sentence is grammatical and the one is not. Why? See, even though they have the same semantics, it is clearly the selection or restrictions that are causing the trouble here. Namely, dash requires uh, some kind of prepositional phrase after it, whereas run does not. What does this tell us? All, this, all these examples tell us that the meaning of, of something is not enough to make it grammatical. Put another way, since we have encoded the meaning as theta roles, we could say, that merely having a theta role to assign is not enough to make a sentence grammatical unless the, the verb or the preposition also has associated with it its appropriate noun phrase or whatever the theta role must be assigned. Let's try and implement this in our grammar. Uh, have the beginnings of a tree here, a sentence breaks into a noun phrase and a verb phrase, and a verb phrase breaks into a verb and noun phrase. Let's merge our object uh, noun phrase. In this case, if the sentence was the cat eats the cheese, then this noun phrase would be the cheese. This verb assigns a patient theta role to that in the following way. I've drawn a little arrow to show that how that works. We merge our noun phrase in the subject position, and the verb assigns an agent theta role. And I've, driven a, I've written a little arrow to show that that is how that happened. So it's very simple. Let's add an adjunct with the prepositional phrase to our example here. Uh, we merge our prepositional phrase, which breaks into a preposition and a noun phrase. This is the selection part going on. The preposition selects its noun phrase, and then it assigns a theta role on the table, suggests a locative theta role. And I've indicated that with a yellow arrow. How about something a little bit more complicated? The cat wonders if there is cheese on the table. Uh, if we have a, the cat is a subject, it gets assigned to agent theta role. And the verb in this case selects a, a whole sentence. It was uh, headed by if so there is cheese on the table. That is a whole sentence all by itself. Well, is it the case then that the verb assigns a patient theta role uh, to that whole sentence? Well, the answer is actually no, because if there is cheese on this table, doesn't seem to be a to play a, a particular semantic role in the sentence. I mean, is it is it a beneficiary? Is it an agent? Patient? No, it doesn't seem to fit any of these things. Why? Well, because it's not really a noun phrase. So only noun phrases end up with theta roll, whereas this is a sentence, so it doesn't end up with a theta roll. But if you look carefully, you'll see some noun phrases inside that, so that you can see the noun phrase cheese and the table are inside that sentence, and they get their theta rolls from inside that sentence. So the table gets its theta roll from the preposition on, and cheese 
gets its theta role from the verb to be is. So in this case, no, we do not assign a theta role uh, from the verb to the whole sentence. And in that case, this is what the structure would look like. Okay, so in this case, this the verb selects a sentence, but it doesn't assign a theta role. Again, this demonstrates that theta roles and selection are not the same thing.